This week, Mike Wilkes, Chief Information Security Officer at Security Scorecard, joins us for an interview about third-party risk. Next up, an interview featuring, featuring Amanda Berlin, Lead Incident Detection Engineer at Blue Mira. Finally, in the security news for this week, Microsoft Zero Days electrical electric vehicles charge points hacked to show naughty videos. We covered that last week, but we're going to cover it again. Chinese <laughs> hackers are using VLC Media Player to launch malware, malware disguised as Telegram, and more. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. If your websites conduct transactions or collect sensitive data, you have a material risk on your hands that could cost millions. The client-side security gap is being exploited daily with attacks like digital skimming, credential harvesting, and form jacking. 98% of sites use first and third-party JavaScript to power and enhance the user experience, opening up the client side to the adversary. Unlike most things in security, there is an easy fix. Start by understanding your risk. Let Source Defense give you a site-wide risk report this week. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash source defense. And welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who wanted to send a duck to space, but found the bill was astronomical. Mr. Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly. It's episode number 736, recorded on April 13th, 2022, right here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Mr. Larry Pesce is ah, here to my left. It's good good, yeah, good to be back. Yeah, good it's good nice to, to have you in studio, man. Yeah, last week was uh, rough, <laughs> to say the least. Yes, yes. To say the least, yep. Another, another round of COVID, and I had to teach for Sans remote at the same time. And yep. Well, at least you were remote. This is true. Like, so, like, plans didn't change. I just had, it sucked. it sucked. I like, we, we've just gone, like, yeah, I had COVID last week. It's good. All right, moving <laughs> yep. on with life. <laughs> moving on, yep. I mean, it's, it's actually encouraging. Yes. It's good. It's, yeah, still did my job. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Josh Morpet is here with us. Josh, welcome. Hey, pleasure to be here again, as always. And uh, Larry, so you isolated while still working. Well done. I know. It's crazy. I'm I'm impressed and terrified all at the same time. It just means I'm efficient or something. No, it means you're stupid, but okay, whatever. <laughs> anyway. There's <laughs> a fine line, right? Are there, uh, where's the rest of the crew tonight? I think uh, I think Tyler might be joining us momentarily okay. here. But uh, yeah, that's sweet. That's what we got. Hopefully we add more hosts as the show uh, goes on. Yep. Uh, Security Weekly listeners, save $100 on your RSA Conference 2022 full conference pass. It's not a half conference pass or a quarter conference pass. That's a full conference pass. RSA Conference will be live in San Francisco June 6th through the 9th. Security Weekly will be there in full force, except I won't be there, delivering real-time live coverage and interviewing some of the event's top speakers and sponsors. To register using our discount code, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC2022 and use the code 52UCYBER, 52UCYBER. We hope to see you there. Mr. Tyler Robinson has joined us. Hey, Tyler. How's it going, Paul? Hey, good to see you, buddy. Glad you're here with us this evening. Uh, this uh, segment is sponsored by Security Scorecard. You can learn more about Security Scorecard by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash security scorecard. Joining us from Security Scorecard, because wow. I had to make sure I said that okay. at least four times. I think it was four. Uh, Mike Wilkes. Mike is the Chief Information Security Officer at Security Scorecard and is a technology evangelist with experience reaching back to the earliest days of the internet in the birth of e-commerce. He and his team built, launched, and supported Starbucks.com in 1998. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's uh, great to, uh, to be here. It's a, a real honor to have a conversation with y'all and talk a little bit about some of my experience and perspectives on risk and uh, security. It's nice to have you uh, here on the show tonight, Mike. I like to start uh, all of our interviews really with uh, asking the question, how did you get your start in information security? Um, well, I've been focusing on it the last five or six years, but um, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I started abusing computers for a living during the whole dot-com rise and fall in California, 
there were no CISOs, right? It wasn't really a title. Um, and so I tell a, a story about um, launching Starbucks.com. Microsoft donated uh, the hardware because they wanted to be able to boast that Starbucks ran on Windows. And I was on the other side of the you know, team, the DevOps team. We called it WebOps back then, but now it'd be called DevOps. Um, that, you know, built and, and prepared it and launched it. And I didn't want to get woken up all the time every time IAS was crashing. So what I actually did was I took a, um, a five, a Spark 5 um, Ultra 5 and put it in front of the Starbucks site, recompiled Apache to give a server header because in that version, you couldn't actually just set it as a configuration management right. and to identify as IAS3. And so I was doing deception and security at the same time because it was a reverse proxy and I was caching all this content from these backend Windows servers. Um, so I think I've been doing security since you know my first 300 baud modem in a Commodore 64, um, you know, breaking security and learning about bullet boards and things like that. Uh, but really as a, a title, you know, I just kind of lucked out. Um, I was working, you know, um, in the Department of Education uh, at the Far Western Laboratory in San Francisco. And uh, we had a T1 into the lab back then, 1994 or so. And, uh, you know, my hobby became my career. I actually have two degrees in philosophy. Um, computers is just the thing that became my career. So uh, that's a little bit of my origin story about how I got into you know, InfoSec. Fantastic. I, I think I try and forget that there were websites in the 90s. <laughs> I think I'm so <laughs> scarred that I'm like, we actually did e-commerce in the 90s. I'm like, oh, yeah, I tried to forget all of that. And uh, there was another guest talking about in the 90s how Microsoft was pushing IIS as the, as the platform encouraging uh, ISPs and others uh, to run that technology. So I interesting stories from Microsoft back in the day that kind of are reemerging today that I'm, I'm you know, kind of surprised uh, and also just really um, well surprised that Microsoft has made the turnaround and some other large companies haven't made quite the turnaround security wise that Microsoft has. Yeah, I've been impressed with what they've done um, in the last, you know, 10 years or so. Windows Subsystem Linux, you know, PowerShell, um, and they're really taking strides, I think, with with Azure. And I mean, you can just go to what shell.azure.com and, and get a Bash shell or a PowerShell on your infrastructure. Um, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, so, Mike, how did you come to Security Scorecard in playing in the kind of third party risk world? Um, well, I actually met um, Alex Yampolsky, the co-founder and CEO, uh, back in 2015, and I've been following the company since then. Uh, it's it's an eight-year-old startup, uh, I guess, uh, if you count back to 2014. Mm. And I was a customer of the platform twice uh, before becoming the CISO. Uh, I joined in August of 2020. Uh, but before that, I was a customer when I was the CISO at ASCAP, uh, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. I'm a jazz musician. I play drums, and I'm an ASCAP member. ASCAP's great. It plays, you know, royalties and, and, and Mike, uh, to is the that, people that is have that, written the songs. Is that Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in the background? Yes, yes. My son's <laughs> having a bassoon lesson uh, in the living room right now. That's so, awesome. Um, That's great. Classical serenade. <laughs> um, uh, it's actually and, uh, a very nice we're a background. Family. It's a nice background music, yeah. so it's good. It's good. And uh, then of the, the, the work at ASCAP is, is amazing in my mind, so just because, you know, Spotify came along and kind of decimated all the mechanical rights they're called, right? The st streaming royalties. Uh, how else could the founder be worth, you know, several billion dollars if, if he hadn't actually extracted value from the music industry? Um, but in this case, you know, the founding, uh, one of the, the what is it, the, um, the chairman of the board at ASCAP is um, Paul Williams, and he wrote the Rainbow Connection for the Muppet movie. Hmm. So you can't imagine a more warm and fuzzy clientele to protect. Hmm. 800,000 members, 1.2 billion in revenue when I was there, and I built the security program there. And I used Security Scorecard to do third-party risk and to actually analyze our own risk as a company uh, and look at our scorecard. But most people actually like to hear about my stories from the one company before that. Uh, where I was the head of security at Marvel for two years. Uh, and I like to joke, it was my job to keep Iron Man safe. <laughs> Their uh, headquarters is still based out of New York? Yeah, Marvel Entertainment, um, 50th Street. I think they're in the Rolling Stone building now. When I worked there, it was um, slightly uh, down the street. But just as cool a job as you can imagine. You walk in, everyone's watching movies, you know, reading comics, and that was their job. And it was my job to keep them safe. Uh, so I was head of DevOps, enterprise architecture, and InfoSec. So I was the three-fourths of all signatures required to get a change into production. I was like, Mike, do you approve these designs that you've secured, you know, that you're about to, uh, you know, implement for the platform? And I was like, yes, I approve my designs. Something about segregation of duties there sounds 
off, but that's just me. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, we like we like to call it a cons- collapsed and consolidated and frictionless uh, <laughs> um, approach to frictionless. Release yes, so. definitely frictionless. Uh, that had yeah. to be, but that had to be somewhat nerve wracking too, based on what happened to Sony Pictures as well. Would that resonate with a lot of folks at at Marvel when you were there? Because I mean, that was a threat oh, model that yeah. happened in real life. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't there for more than a month when there was a breach of the Daredevil account um, on mm-hmm. social media by Crowdmind. And they are ethical. They said, hey, you should really set up two factor auth on your franchise Twitter accounts um, with all these users. And it wasn't us, actually, um, that was breached. I think it was um, a social media manager at uh, Netflix or something, because we shared a lot of these properties with them at the mm-hmm. time. But talk about a large you know, real estate of, to protect um, 5,000, you know characters in the marvel cinematic universe or comics universe um, as well and then times every social media platform you know so i mean you don't want um captain america tweeting something like hail hydra right even though he said it in the movies yeah (laughs) yeah certainly and certainly a lot of intellectual property to protect as well as third-party relationships right i mean i already mentioned sony I've kind of loosely caught up recently what Marvel and Sony have been, you know, they struck struck some deals for Spider-Man, right? So I'm assuming there was lots of other third-party yeah. relationships, yeah. Yeah, the licensing gets pretty complicated, which is why we never saw a Venom film for so long. But now, you know, that's sort of being repaired, those relationships. Um, I think it was because of a really large percentage of the revenue had to go to the creator. Um, he held on to strong um, uh, intellectual property rights there. Mm. But they eventually did it. And, yeah, the Sony relationship was massaged and, and improved with Tom Holland and making the Spider-Man movies, you know, hits again. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, stories. Like, one of the things I did when I first was at you know marvel i ran disney's um, scorecard and i sent you know the report uh, off to the global CISO uh, glenn taylor and i said to him you know there's there's a lot of things in here you're aware of and that you are working on fixing but there's some things that are going to surprise you and i think that's one of the cool aspects of the platform discovery um you've you've heard of rogue it right people yeah. stand things up with a credit card on linode or aws you know in the marketing shadow department. it rogue yeah, it, yeah, same yeah, thing. it still gets yeah. called shadow it but which can mean different things but certainly all same. we're all yeah. talking about the same same thing yeah and so this is something that you, helps right because we're scanning all of ipv4 every day and we find about 50 to 60 billion vulnerabilities every week we map those back into a scorecard and we give people a letter grade a through f stumbling down easy right for the board of directors to understand how's your posture how's your posture compared to your competitors things like that but the discovery aspect aspect was really fun and the story i tell about this was finding an open ftp server and they're like no no you know disney has forbidden public facing ftp servers for the last three years you know it can't possibly be true and of course i I type in the ip address on the disney confluence and up comes you know the match and it's like oh look there's a username and a password here and so i type it and i log in and there was the script for the jimmy kimmel uh, show for that night right for abc so it was a forgotten content management system integration that had fallen off of the declarative assets Mm -hmm. and was still there right as a part of your attack surface and so i think that it's useful obviously who's who's going to pay you know, Qualys or Tenable or Rapid7 to scan all of IPv4, looking for assets that you forgot about or that you didn't even know existed. And so we're doing that for you. So that's one of the things I found of great value in the platform as a mm. client. There, Some would say that there's more value in doing a more in-depth test with actual humans. I think, I think now we're probably beyond that, but I do want to bring it up that uh, some of the arguments I heard when third-party risk and evaluations were taking place they were like well it's, it's not a pen test i'm like yeah but it's not cool it isn't to be a pen test um so like where is it a vulnerability scan is it an asset discovery is, is there some pen test aspect to it like when you do a third party assessment through security scorecard like how do, how do you classify that mike mm-hmm. well i think it's useful to know what is the digital footprint of the entity that you're, you're looking at, right? And if you're going to shortlist, you know, four or five vendors, you know, the one that has an A is is obviously a lot less risky. Um, but you're right; it's it's passive scanning. We're not breaking the law. We're not doing actual pen testing. We're just doing passive collection of open source intelligence. We look at the headers, we look at the DNS records, and we can see if you have a mal misconfigured SPF record and someone can spoof emails and then business email compromise risk. Mm -hmm. We can see if you've opened up port 3389 for Microsoft RDP. Uh, Like the Okta breach recently, Okta wasn't attacked. It was Citel, right? They're 
provider, their third party or fourth party in this case, you know, risk. And, you know, you could see that Citadel had a bad score for the last 12 months and someone had gotten clever and was making their job easier by RDPing into a, a, a machine that they had you know, built in, in AWS. And then they were running all of the Okta admin tools from there. Um, so I think that it's, it's, not, um, it's not sufficient to do outside in, uh, but it's absolutely necessary, I think, to understand what is your attack surface? What is the size of your digital footprint? And then we score someone with a million IP addresses totally differently than we score someone with 10, mm-hmm. right? If you have a really bad finding and you only have 10 public facing assets or IP addresses, that one bad finding is gonna tank your score, right? But if you're shell.com, for example, and you've got a million or 2 million IP addresses, you can have a lot of you know, mistakes, so to speak, that you can still have an A. And so I think it's important to understand that we cluster based on the size of your digital footprint. And it's not really a, um, a pen test, but it is like the reconnaissance phase of what bad guys would do. So why shouldn't you know everything that the bad guys can know about you and all of your third parties? And they obviously go for the weakest link and they will attack the weakest link instead of you. Uh, so you better have a good sense of your own security posture and that of your critical vendors. You know, it's interesting, Mike, you, you mentioned the the vendor of the vendor, right? And we talk about that in the context of security libraries and such and how you deal with the transient dependencies and the resulting vulnerabilities. Does that translate Mm -hmm. to third party, fourth, fifth vendors, those transient risks of I've got a third party, but they use, they use another to them. It's a third party. Maybe to you, it's a fourth party, right? Is that how you kind of, is that how you phrase that? Yeah, um, I think of it as like nth party essentially at that point because yeah. it could yeah. be fifth or sixth, right? Like all of your third parties that you have contracts with that are hosting things for you. I mean, how often has AWS gone down in US East recently and brought down a disproportionate size you know, of yep. a portion of the internet? Um, that's concentration risk. So you may be fault tolerant and highly available, but your third parties may have put all their eggs in one basket, AKA running their entire infrastructure in US East. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's when we realize that uh, we really do need to be able to map and do auto vendor detection. Um, but going back to your previous um, comment about humans, I love having a really good, you know, pen tester, you know, annually come in and do the work. And we just recently launched our um, Hacker One vulnerability disclosure program. Uh, and so we have a security.txt file on our website. That's how you would report things to us. It goes to Hacker One, they triage it. So this is like 24 by seven, you know, pen testing essentially. And Hacker One folks, they find things that are not just, oh, this CVE is vulnerable because you're running a old version of Nginx or Apache. And they find business logic flaws, right? They find all sorts of useful stuff. So I've been a big fan of there. We actually have Hacker One signals in our scorecards. And the ad that came on at the beginning um, for Source Defense, they're a partner of ours as well in our marketplace. And so all of the Source Defense signals show up on scorecards as well. So now we have CrowdStrike um, just recently announced as Inside Out some um, scores plus our outside in. Uh, we have uh, something new coming up with Palo Alto that I think I'm allowed to talk about um, Uh, because it's going to launch publicly soon. Um, And then uh, a bunch of other useful ones like Cybel, what is it called? Dark Owl and Cybel Angel um, to help surface some of the signals. Uh, And of course, Hack Notice and Hacker One shows up. And so really, we're just building this this basic concept of how do you assess and quantify risk? How do you make it communicable to the board? Because the board doesn't understand this stuff, right? You put a table and you set CISO at the seat Right, because Solar Winds, Kaseya, and now Octo, all of these supply chain attacks, um, and even the open source stuff like Log4j, which wasn't even a, an attack, it was just a vulnerability. It has really brought to the attention of everyone, but no one really speaks this crazy moon language of, of CISOs and InfoSec professionals. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we're using these basic letter grades to describe people's risk. And my classic example is, you know, you show someone their scorecard and they often get, you know, very defensive. They're like, well, my security is better than that. Um, and so I like to think they go through the five stages of grief, you know, yeah. denial, bartering, anger, frustration. Eventually they reach acceptance. Um, but I like to show them a very inoffensive pairing. I'll show them Coke versus Pepsi. I'll show them the Packers versus the Bears, right? And just compare two entities, get familiar with the factors and the scores and the weights and things like that, and then show them their own scorecard. And that's usually a much better way to get fast forward to acceptance and say, okay, you're right. You know, there is some stuff out there that I don't think is the most risky, but it could be a part of a, a breach, you know, and a kill chain uh, risk. It's interesting to think about today, Mike, when you show someone their grade, whether regardless of the grade, right? Uh, let's just say it's not an A, um, mm-hmm. you know, they've got some work to do. You've got a lot of options. I think 
20 years ago, you were like, we need to get some pen testers in here, right? And I think for many organizations, they need internal pen test teams, certainly in the financial sector in many, you gotta do some pen testing. But I think for many organizations with breach and attack simulation, attack surface management, um, vulnerability scanning, uh, you know, all those technologies today, you can get a lot of good information about the overall security posture uh, of your organization, you know, without, you know, bringing pen testers in every single day to go, yeah, here's the, like your low hanging fruit. I think you can discover that stuff on your own. So that by the time security scorecard does the analysis, I mean, you're likely at probably an A if you're using all of those things appropriately, no? You'd think that was true, and you'd think that'd be the case. But um, one of the ways I've put it, you know, someone asked me, well, what if everyone had an A? Would security scorecard go out of business, right? If everyone did the basics and just right. did HSTS headers, you know, had proper, you know, DMARC, DKIM, and, and SPF, and and had, you know, um, all of this stuff that is the most common, you know, defects that we find on scorecards. Um, no, we wouldn't go out of business. We'd just find new interesting signals. Um, we've got a really great threat intelligence team. We poached some really great talent from former McAfee employees. <laughs> and we're running stuff now that's like nation state threat actors. And we're doing briefings for the FBI and for, you know, international um, uh, governments and organizations to help track down and, and take some of these bad actors out. Uh, we discovered a, a botnet that was being used in Ukraine. Uh, we, we gave it the name Zodnost, um, which I think is um, Russian for greed uh, in some format of translation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really useful to understand that, you know, let's say you have 60,000 vulnerabilities, you know, <clears throat> through your internal scanning with, with Tenable or something. All of them aren't equal. You know, many of them may be critical, but if there's no exploit code and no one's actively probing you uh, for those exploits, you don't have to patch that as quickly as you have to patch the ones that are being actively exploited in the wild. So think of the you know CISA um, list and catalog of risks, right? They want to get your pulse secure VPNs. They want to get your MFAs in place. They want to hit all of the really easy stuff that they know is being exploited. And so I think that's the combination of you know threat intelligence layered on top of you know, security ratings, security rating shows you the attack surface and then threat intelligence tells you what to focus on first. The prioritization you know, is, is always the tricky part. It's always the most difficult mm -hmm. thing. I think, well, I, you know, having worked, sorry, Josh, having worked in vulnerability yeah. management, it, people are like, ah, oh, your tool is great. It finds all the stuff. And then they're like, not all the stuff, but most of it. Right. And then other people be like, Hey, your your tool finds too much stuff. Now I got to go fix it. And I'm like, wait, that's not how it's supposed to work. <laughs> and then how do I prioritize it? Right. That's that's really the yeah. challenge. But at a certain a certain time when you have too much stuff going on, you're just screwed, you know. And and so, but it's it's interesting that you pointed out the outside in inside out points. And uh, by the way, I do want to say that I did donate to your jazz fundraiser a while back. Um, oh yeah. For so, the uh, uh, National Jazz Museum in Harlem, yeah. But, uh, and I'm glad you got this gig. It's really good, man. Congrats. Um, but uh, I think that the interesting point is that Security Scorecard takes a lot of, of heat for just having an external view. And so you've been working on changing that over the last, what, couple of years, year or so, uh, to make it so that there's the inside out as well as the outside in. And I think in general, that's lovely. That's appropriate. That's the way it should be. Because there's no way you're going to get a proper view of an organization, of a company, of an agency, of a whatever, from simply an outside-in point of view, as you put it. Um, I'm curious, when, not, not just when will you have prioritization, as Paul pointed out, that is not fun, but when will you have enough data to get a real good idea of how well that third or fourth or 12th party is doing is it now do you have enough data right now to give me a a very good idea a solid certifiable answer or are you waiting for what, what's the next technology you want to integrate in to bring that outside in and inside out view i just want to say also before mike answers that mike you have the best poker face like i do not want to play poker with you ever <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i i i've, I've I've lost some hands um, with some of my uh, former Stanford uh, classmates when we get together sometimes. So um, maybe I'm just demonstrating good poker face uh, on the call today. But uh, Great poker um, I think that the holistic view of risk is where every CISO and every InfoSec professional wants to be. And yeah. 
Um, I like to use a, a metaphor, uh, not a, a metaphor, it's actually a, a quote from an ancient Greek philosopher and historian. And this helps me explain and answer, you know, what you're talking about, uh, Josh. Uh, Heraclitus, uh, he was an ancient Greek philosopher and historian, and he said, you can never step into the same river twice. And the reason I like this phrase is because to me, it encapsulates the dynamic nature of cybersecurity and risk, right? The board is just like, are we good? Yes, no. Um, and, and there's no right answer to that question, right? You say, yes, we're good. You're lying. You say, no, we're not good. You know, um, they're upset. They don't want to hear that answer. And so you need to qualify it and have a better answer that says, well, you made a kind of a mistake. Security is not a state, right? It's a process. And with this, with this river analogy, um, this is not AI machine learning hype, right? This is what you might call OG InfoSec, meaning, you know, if you're going to run and step up to the river, I'm a different CISO this year than I was, you know, a year or two ago. And the things Absolutely. that I'm protecting and the nature of the world has changed radically, right, with the pandemic. Mike, I wanted to ask you a question along those lines that, you know, we, we talked about a lot of different technologies for assessing your security posture, but as we all know that changes in a lot of organizations on an hourly basis so like what my external footprint in view to the world looks like now like wait an hour that could be totally different kind of like the weather in rhode island let's just say if you don't like the weather in rhode island just wait an hour um mm -hmm. do you i believe you also give that historical leave it's a five minute walk right yeah. <laughs> but you you give that uh, historical reference. In other words, like you scan the same company at certain points in time, and then I get like a report that shows their kind of graph over time. Is that that's a thing? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. That's that's one of the things that I found most useful. Is like if you're going to start scanning with Tenable or like I said, Rapid Seven or Qualys or something, you suddenly learn what their risk posture is now, right? If you decide to scan a bunch of public IPs and find expired certificates, you know, sure. uh, mismatched, you know, bad use of TLS, you know, 1.0 or something. Um, but so we're scanning every day and some of the faster moving currents of the internet we would be the cloud service provider IP blocks. So that's about 60 to 70 million IP addresses, right? That fall under, it could be anyone's ALB today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we actually scan those ranges 12 times a day. And if we don't get a match, an attribution match, 10 of those 12 scans, we just can't attribute it, right? Because attribution is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, the three letter agencies know it, right? Um, a, a botted, you know, university computer, you know, at a, at a you know, computer lab uh, could be owned by the you know the Chinese the Russians and the north you know or the Iranians at the same time right you've you've seen instances where there are multiple breaches and they're un uninstalling each other's malware um, and so I think that it's it's important to reflect on the fact that yes yeah we scan all of the internet a lot of those assets are very static the ones that are very fast moving we give our best chance right and our refute rate of our observations is about one one and a half percent and so if we're seeing 50 to 60 billion vulnerabilities every week plus we also have a top five sinkhole um, infrastructure where we're pulling in about 700 million malware events per day. So imagine, you know, Japanese diplomats on in on holiday in Paris. We're seeing those command and control signals come into our sinkhole domains, and we map that back through to the entities as well. So we've got lots of good, you know, really really good data, um, but. Going back to the holistic, uh, you know, how do you solve for inside out plus outside in? Uh, that's why we have this marketplace. That's why we're trying to be very agnostic about um, partnering with everyone and letting, you know, uh, Palo Alto come in, letting CrowdStrike come in and to basically send, you know, queries, right? We look at the inside assets and then we rank and score them using our algorithms that have been calibrated and fine-tuned you know monthly for the last seven eight years uh, and we use that to come up with a score for the inside risk then you really do have a good perspective that that no one can deny because you have that privileged inside out perspective oh there is a WAF here oh you know there is like um you know endpoint security you, they may still be using 2008 right windows 2008 on a machine you know and we may detect that um uh, through some of our purchasing of ad tech data we buy ad tech data not to sell you you know a pair of shoes we buy the ad tech data for the user agent string, mm -hmm. which tells you the version of the operating system and the version of the browser. And then we know which NATed IP address it came from. So we just map it through to you and say, hey, guess what? You're still running Windows 7. It's like, how do you know that? And it's like, well, someone's browsing CNN.com and we buy the ad tech data that tells us that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, when, one thing that comes to mind is that I think when many of us have done uh, penetration testing, when I was doing internal assessments, vulnerability assessments, when I worked for university, right? There's, 
I, it, I don't know how frequently occurring it is, right? But you would get started on the assessment, and at some point, you're like, oh, someone else has already been here. <laughs> like, you're already owned. <laughs> like, now we have to flip into doing a pen test, uh, an assessment of any Threat kind. Hunting. Yeah, yep. to incident response mode because you know you're you're, mm-hmm. you're compromised i'm assuming you built some of that into the the security scorecard platform as well because that would impact a score i want to partner i want to acquire this company but they've already got had an incident they just don't they're know actively it yet. Yeah. breached at the moment yeah, yeah. and right. i'm assuming it sounds like the data sources you're pulling you could you could uh, garner that information in some cases we do yeah. yeah and that's the kind of thing that we can't necessarily share but um meaning we're, we're very as, tra- as pe- transparent as we can be. Mm. So you can get a free account for your domain and log in and see 100% of your data on our platform for free. Mm-hmm. You don't have to pay to see every row level observation of IP address and on what date and what vulnerabilities. Um, interesting, the academic piece that you mentioned. Um, I'm an adjunct professor. I teach uh, cybersecurity at NYU mm-hmm. uh, for the last two years now. And I've been taking my students and using the platform to give NYU free security assessments. And so they've been doing you know, um, what uh, NYU Langone, they looked at the maker space, right, at Tandon. Um, they've looked at, you know, the alumni infrastructure because there's a lot of PII there. And so I've been delivering like, you know, 15 per semester or so security assessments for free using our platform and other tools to NYU. And NYU has a huge digital footprint and they have a really bad score. <laughs> and so does their major rival, right, Columbia, right? Uh Universities have huge IP spaces, aka large digital footprint, and you have professors that think that they're systems administrators. Like, why can't I run MySQL on the internet and just open it up, you know, and then have all this data available? Because uh, they're very trusting in that regards, and they're always understaffed, right? I don't, uh, you know, have any uh, malice towards you know the NYU infrastructure team. They're they're a small team with a huge risk, you know, to mitigate, uh, and so we try to help with that, right? And, and we partner. Um, I'm actually. Uh, working on a new course uh, for a nine month CISO certification program that NYU is launching. Um, and Ed Amoroso is, is one of the lead faculty teaching it. And my course, uh, my elective course for that program is on threat intelligence and cybersecurity analytics, uh, because that's you know, what I've been doing for the last couple of years, you know, pretty nonstop. And it's really nice to be able to you know, have that academic, you know, public private partnership and to help people identify risk and get over it, right? And to mitigate it and to shut down, you know, those open RDP servers, those open MySQL instances. And if you don't know about it, how can you possibly mitigate it? And so I like to think that, you know, in towards the path of change and, and awareness, you need to have awareness, exception, acceptance and action. And so we're providing the awareness. You know, your CISOs and your security team have to kind of accept the validity of what we're saying about your score and your posture. And then eventually you have to take action and you have to shut stuff down or put up a firewall or, you know, um, but there are some, you know, some people out there that have like honeypots and we'll, we'll work with you. You know, if you actually have intentionally vulnerable infrastructure out there, let's say that you're FireEye and you want to do signals intelligence gathering, you know, we, we can take those IP address ranges for your honeypot networks and we can take them off of your scorecard. That's legitimate you know, reason, you know, deception programs make a lot of sense um, to be able to figure out what the bad guys are up to. And so you're never going to patch those, you know, honeypots, right? That's, that's the oldest trick in the book, though. Uh, that wasn't a security incident. That was a honeypot. <laughs> well, we need to have a reasonable assertion of uh, yes. truth on your side as to why we should take it off. But uh, even if you're not a paying customer, we want our data to be correct. To be accurate, so sure. you can actually open up a support ticket with us and not even be a paying customer. Huh. Mike, why? I, I mean, we, I've looked in a lot of this technology, as of many of us have, in doing external assessment, uh, you know, asset inventory to uh, discovering all kinds of different things. You know, a lot of these various tools and techniques and tactics are, are out there. And what, what I guess what separates an organization from doing it themselves versus going to security scorecard and, and kind of outsourcing that? Mm hmm. Well, um, again, it's that declarative assets versus discovered assets um, perspective. Your 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 real world de facto assets are always going to be a superset of what you think of as your declarative. And if you go to the network team and say, well, "Let's do a pen test," and what are we going to test? Well, we're going to test these ten addresses and this IP address, you know, and this app um, because this is a new feature and functionality that we're launching. And so that's good. You should do that. Um, but you don't know what you don't know, right? It's that classic. Uh, 
Rumsfeld, you know, the unknown unknowns. Right. Um, and well, so I we're, also we're think in a it's like that, to help you discover that. It's like that unit testing versus QA versus users using it in production. As a developer, it's hard to test mm-hmm. your own code. I think it's some of the reason why I would I would outsource it because you get that tunnel vision. Yeah, that's that's why we trust third parties, you know, to do pen tests, right? Because they're not biased. Right. They don't miss, you know, the glaring holes. You know, um, what was the uh, funny one that happened a while back? Um, somebody sent a whole bunch of emails through the FBI because yes. they had built some type of law enforcement agency website that was allowed you to send, you know, emails through their system because it was like a registration flow. And so, who the hell? Thought, sorry, my uh, swearing. Who the heck thought it was a good idea to hook up this non-classified, non-mission you know mission critical site to the actual production FBI web servers? And so someone was like trolling Krebs, right? They sent an email saying Krebs has a botnet on his forehead. Check the DMARC and the origin of these emails. They came from the FBI. And of course, the FBI thought, oh my God, we've been breached. And it turns out it wasn't, right? It was just a simple OWASP top 10 vulnerability on a brochure kind of site you know, for law enforcement agencies um, to work with them. Okay, just a note. Shit, who let this man swear? <laughs> Cursing's it's totally okay. Allowed. We swear on the show. It's all right. It's totally allowed. Excellent. I, uh, I wasn't I sure curious. if this is the uh, after nine p.m. radio, um, you know, kind of uh, legislation about swearing. So. It is. Thankfully, we are not regulated by any government entity. <clears throat> yeah. Thank <laughs> God. Yes. <I, laughs> hopefully, we can. I am curious, right. kind of some of the the new things that you guys are working on and how the change in threat landscape with things like you know DNS over HTTPS and web sockets being used and IPv6 uh, to IPv4 proxy and relay stuff like how does all of some of the newer technologies and, and what the attackers are adapting to how does that play into your uh, risk profile and uh, how are you adapting that and what kind of stuff are you moving towards in the future that's great um area to to ask the question um we're innovating you know left right and center to figure out new signals um we we've just um we have a quarterly release cycle and so this quarter we're releasing a whole bunch of new signals that we've gathered um and we're putting them in first as informational um ipv6 total nightmare right you can't scan all of ipv6 um, people have written research papers, you know, I mean, it's it's like one IP address for every grain of sand on every beach, you know, uh, or every star in the in the universe. Um, and so we're going to have to have a totally different approach, you know, to dealing with what parts of IPv6 are actually lit up um, and how can we scan them rather than just saying, oh, there's, you know, 4 billion you know, IPv4 addresses or whatever, and let's just scan all that. We built the infrastructure to do that. And we actually scan some of the high-risk geographies from within uh, those geographies. So we don't get lied to right by an F5. This is, oh, you're coming from security scorecard. You know, we have nothing to show you. Um, and that's more deception that we're starting to notice as well. So we scan China from within China and we scan Russia from within Russia. Uh, we have like 12 countries where we run our scanning infrastructure from. So think of Shodan, but we're at like 2,300 ports uh, that we're scanning now across all of IP4. Um, so that's hopefully going to stay, you know, uh, but uh, people moving to more and more cloud service providers and having, you know, less and less, you know, attributable IP space, you know, that causes sparsity of signal. Uh, so we need to find other sources of information, uh, potentially partnerships with ISPs or with, you know, the people that are doing, you know, the SSL proxying, uh, like the blue coats and stuff like that, or the DNS over HTTPS, maybe Cisco, you know, Umbrella, which was the former or project uh, open dns you know they still know who's querying which you know um dot are you hack me now dot are you addresses and stuff on the inside even if it isn't visible in the in the dns um, databases that are out there that we um, access uh, to find that data uh in terms of um uh what was the other one of the other technologies that you mentioned um just you know the, the cleverness of the bad guys um forces us to find new ways to to deal with um with uh, you know, finding their behavior. We've been uh, looking at NetFlow data, for example. Uh, NetFlow was really rich for us when we investigated Colonial Pipeline. We actually saw the 106 gigabytes of data get exfiltrated from the Colonial Pipeline server to a uh, DigitalOcean server here in New York. We called law enforcement it's like that scene in the movie, right, where someone puts a packet of uh, information on a, underneath a park bench in the spy films. Um, no one ever came and picked up that packet. Uh, we kept looking at the NetFlow data around that DigitalOcean server, and you know, 
Colonial Pipeline didn't pay the ransom because they didn't have backups. They paid the ransom because of the extortion play, right? And uh, now there's also a DDoS play, plus it's like double and triple extortion uh, on top of the ransomware. Uh, but yeah, Colonial Pipeline paid the 5 million because they didn't want that 106 gigs of data to be published on the dark web. And thankfully it wasn't. And then miraculously, somehow someone traced down, you know, who was it um, that did Colonial? Was it... Uh, um, Dark side. I think they left it in a hot wallet that was in a custodial, you know, um, uh, uh, crypto space in Northern California. And so they recovered 85% of, of the ransomware, uh, which is just unheard of, you know, in this kind of uh, day and age with people should have taken that offline quickly if they had you know, all that money. Right? What You wonder yeah. what was in that 106 gigs worth of data, though. Uh, oh, well, I'm sure reason. it was uh, dangerous stuff. Um, actually, Colonial shut down the pipeline. Uh, this was something that I learned through Dragos.com. Um, uh, they do OT security stuff, uh, operations. Yeah, technology. we know them well. Yeah. Uh, was, it, really, was it the billing? Yeah. Was it really the billing systems? Did they publish that? It was the nomination system. Yeah. yeah. So they didn't shut it down out of a prevalence of, of um, care and caution for the health and safety of the world. They did it because they just couldn't figure out how to much to charge people yep. for the gas. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and so that's very <laughs> not. You know, that's the, what, what do you call it? Disingenuous kind of motivation, actually. Right? Mm. Uh, but I love um, working in the oil and gas industry. I'm a part of the World Economic Forum's working group. Um, I was nominated. We're a technology pioneer, as was Dragos.com. That's how I met uh, Rob Lee. And uh, we're working on principles for governance at the oil and gas because, you know, Saudi Aramco had a really tough last couple of breaches as well. And, you know, so the, all these international players are together and we're doing white papers. I wrote one that was a case study on how to do event-based assessments. So for, forget this sending a questionnaire once a year. Um, we can have customers and we do have customers like Intel, for example, they have like 40,000 vendors in a portfolio mm. and they really have their finger on the pulse, right? Of their third-party risk because they're not just sending a questionnaire out once a year. As soon as one of those customers has a data breach, um, has a score drop, uh, or even has a single CVE appear that they think of as high risk, it'll automatically send them an Atlas questionnaire, which is our way of doing like a SIGLite, SIGFUL, HIPAA, PCI, any kind of framework you might want. We have about 29 of them. You send them a questionnaire automatically, um, and that way you're automating and running at scale, third-party risk. Think of like Nike class, you know, supply chain risk or Apple, right? Apple got poached, you know, and, and popped by someone in Taiwan that had access, right? And they tried to ransomware Apple and Apple said, screw you. And so they started to ransom, you know, uh, the, the Taiwanese company. Uh, so it's all about third and fourth party risk at this point, because, you know, we're such a connected complex system of digital dependency uh, and software, as well as entities uh, and providers uh, that you really do want to be able to, you know, survey um, potentially, you know, thousands of, of, uh, of attack um, vectors and not have to have a 300 person vendor risk management team to do it. Right. And, and part of that is the data, which, which you collect from various sources. Uh, I mean, and mm -hmm. I think, didn't you get mentioned by uh, John Oliver recently? Uh, I don't know if it was, we missed it. Um, we certainly had a reference in the, in the register, um, in, in, the, in Congress, uh, we submitted a report, uh, on the oil and uh, gas uh, pipeline. No, uh, risk. he did a he did a story on data brokers, and uh, it was not very complimentary on data brokers as a whole. Uh, and I think he mm -hmm. mentioned uh, your company because uh, you buy such significant quantities of information from uh, uh, from people uh, over. I, I'm not sure if you were named directly. Dimitri says he doesn't. He doesn't. Uh, this is on Discord. Doesn't think you were named directly. I could have sworn you were, but I could be wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it well, was we're on, certainly not uh, access like brokers, show. Um, but some people do confuse us with that because like, how come the bad guys, you know, don't just use you and log in and figure out who to attack. And it's like, believe me, the bad guys already have all this data. <laughs> it's, it's the actual owners of the assets that don't know all of these things about their risk. And that's why we're here. The cobbler's Help children. Yeah, better of course. Place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we've also got a question on discord, whether somebody who's not in that college can take your courses. Um, one of them, um, I actually published 12 of my lectures on YouTube from my spring semester on information security uh, management. And I wax philosophic, you know, I use the Heraclitus quote, but I also talk about the nature of risk and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, the birth of cyberspace, I like to quote William Gibson, you know, and the birth of the term. And so I'm not your typical professor. Um, I'm a practitioner, you know, I've been, like I said, abusing computers, you know, since I had a 300 baud modem. Um, uh, and a Commodore 64. Although my first computer was a Timex Sinclair, actually with 2K of memory, um, but that kind of dates me. Uh, but I've been using the internet since the protocols. Like I was 
actually running a Gopher server um, at the at the Department of Education think tank in San Francisco, the Port Seventy uh, University of Minnesota. Um, mascot is the gopher and then, and then along came port 80 right and ncsa mosaic and and i was working in san francisco at organic um and launched like i said starbucks macy's playstation i launched all of these websites for them ran the teams that built them and hosted them and uh it was just fascinating to see you know this this um you know, technology spring up and, and uh, my facility, you know, uh, with it was, uh, you know, a good, uh, a good career path that I didn't know I was going to take. Uh, the reason I mentioned organic online, it was one of the first web design houses. When I walked into organic, there was one server hosting Nike, McDonald's, Kinko's, Levi's, and uh, King and, and Volvo. And uh, the Apache Foundation, Brian Bellendorf, he was the CTO of organic at the time. He created Mod Rewrite on organic time so that we could host all those websites behind one IP address. Oh, interesting. Was that before virtual hosting was in, introduced into Apache? Yeah, this is like Apache one dot, you know, wow. two or something, you know, era. And uh, anyway, it was really great learning Apache from uh, Brian. That's like sitting at the masters, you know, feet yeah, and, yeah. and learning how to build Apache and, and like, harden it. Like how did you, uh, most people's did problems, you say you have, yeah. have two degrees in philosophy? Yeah, I'm an undergraduate from UW Madison, and then uh, a master's in philosophy of education from Stanford. Did you? How did that help you in in technology and security? That's an interesting trend. We talk a lot about how people get into the field, right? It's a really interesting yeah, transition. Yeah. yeah, I didn't study comp sci. Um, mm. My my example here is if you're a sculptor, you make art, and you you know chisels, right, and tools, and and, and marble. Um, you don't study chisels, right? It's like studying computer science to be a technologist is like studying chisels. I like to use computers as a tool for something else like education and, and communication and, and uh, commerce. And so for me, um, at first there were some head scratchers. People are saying like, I don't understand why, why, why should we hire you? You know, you, you don't have a degree in comp sci, you studied philosophy. I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, what did I study? I studied logic, right? Propositional mm -hmm. logic. Um, I studied, you know, analogies and metaphors and help explain things to exactly executives. And so there's a lot of skills now as I look back that really helped me uh, to be able to be down in the weeds technical and understand, you know, uh, uh, DNS. I, I wrote a book for Cisco Press in 2002 for a certification that doesn't exist anymore, um, Cisco Internet Solution Specialist. And uh, it's funny, you know, I mean, there's so much detail, um, but the, a lot of people get lost in those weeds and never find their way back to be able to talk to someone like my parents and to be able to explain the nature of some of these you know, happenings on the internet um, and why we need to you know, improve and move away from passwords and try to get to passwordless authentication and things like that. And so I think it's been really helpful to be good at analysis Analogies and metaphors and I use them a lot when I speak with people and I don't have to teach them anything I just have to say you know this thing that you know it's kind of like this other thing that you don't know and this is the relationship and then they go ah right it's um, almost like um you know that drawing of the duck that looks like a rabbit and we, we're not going to argue about the dots on the page right those should be the facts right the ink on the mm -hmm. page um, but it's it's called like a gestalt uh, and so you yeah. switch your gestalt when you see the rabbit you can't see it as the duck anymore and so i don't need to teach people things to change their understanding of technology i just need to find some really good gestalt shifts and help them realize that they already have what they need to know to go about prioritizing the risk and doing risk-based assessments and running a program and, and figuring out what to do next because I've been like around very, so long, uh, right? It's a very philosophical look on the issue. <laughs> it, it is, and I, I like to inject that, I obviously, it. It. You know, oh, into good. my students. So. Well, I think if also, I had a Marvel character, um, I, I think my, my Marvel origin story would be like Professor Eclecticus. Um, <laughs> and it would be like a, That's you've awesome. spent some time thinking about that, haven't you? Which people great. have asked me who's my favorite you know superhero and that's of course i think iron man because he's not a god a mutant or you know um, his his power um, and his weapon is his brain is, is his intellect yeah. which i i always and I've he's got some issues he's got some sure. trust issues you know sure. that's why ultron came into a being right but, yes um, yes for sure some trust issues some trust yeah. issues i also i think if you go to a dark the... space sometimes but yes. now of course you know if if you saw what happened you know in infinity war and uh Endgame. I was not there to protect Iron Man at that point. I had already left Marvel. So. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the story arc for me is really about Tony Stark in, in Iron Man, which I, I really enjoyed that arc. Uh, and I thought they did a great job with it. I also, Doctor Strange is one of my favorite Marvel characters as well. Yeah, that's I, true. He's a mere mortal as well. 
Love it. Love it. Um, oh, analogies. I love that you're able to, like, I think some analogies that we make in cybersecurity to things outside of cybersecurity, like, some are, like, not good at all. Some are just okay. And some, like, really are awesome, right? And those are the ones I think we really need to gravitate towards. Um, mm -hmm. I thought Jack Resider did a great job when he was interviewing HD Moore in his most recent episode when he talked about exploits and payloads. He said the exploit is the needle and the payload is what's inside the syringe. Like, okay, that mm -hmm. one that one holds up. Like I like I like that. So I like analogies, like you said, Mike, that you can explain to your parents and your friends who are not in cybersecurity or technology and all and at all and allow them to understand at least certain aspects i've got a good one for you um i didn't invent this one but i discovered it you remember specter and meltdown right yeah and so i asked this when i interviewed candidates like explain to me the vulnerability right because it was what um speculative execution in the mm -hmm. silicon right of the actual cpu if it's evaluating an if then clause it'll actually evaluate both outcomes and figure out what it needs right speculative execution mm -hmm. um but how do you explain that to um you know like i said an executive and why did the whole world have to just stop everything right and patch for this firmware hardware level etched in silicon problem uh, where user space was violated and you could get into kernel space. Right. And the analogy I found was a fast food restaurant. So a fast food restaurant at, at lunch, um, everyone's lined up you know, to the drive through window and they start making and ordering hamburgers. Um, the analogy here is the CPUs had to be faster, right? And so Intel and, and all the others were working on these different ways to do that. And speculative execution was one of the ways. Um, the vulnerability though meant that if you walk up or you know, drive up to the window and you order a burger and you get it in 30 seconds, it came off of the cache, aka the heat lamp, and it was made before you actually ordered it. Mm. And then you can take advantage of these vulnerability to know what the person in line uh, ordered. Right. And that's the cool analogy. And of course, if it took them a minute to, to deliver your burger, then it would get came you know, from you know, actual memory space and it wasn't uh, out of cash. And so for me, this was a useful analogy to share. And I like to share as much of this cleverness as I can um, that I find um, to help people and give them that explanatory power. Because I think Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities are coming back. Right. There's a couple of recent um, resurgences of that. And people had to sort of fuzz, you know, the web browser time granularity because, again, cash be exploited and if it comes back really fast you knew it came off of the cache uh, so side loading attacks um, for spectre and meltdown was one of my favorite examples of, of how to use um, a powerful analogy yeah and they don't always work some people make analogies and they don't they don't work as well so i think arming folks with analogies that do work mike like you just did is is important yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a skill. Um, you have to actually be able to be like a systems thinker, um, mm -hmm. and not just say you know that you know like what was it uh, log for shell? You know, um, lots of uh, lots of people were wondering how to figure out you know the expanse of this, and and I looked at some of the stuff that Sonatype published about uh, Apache struts, right? Um, that was the Equifax breach in 2017. And they wrote a really great blog piece that talked about how we still see people downloading vulnerable versions of Struts 2. Mm -hmm. Like 37% of all downloads, you know, this last month or last week were for vulnerable versions. So that means log for shell because it's so much more ubiquitous, is going to be the source of lots of root cause analysis for breaches for the next five years. Because we're in 2022 and, you know, Equifax was in 2017. And so we're, we're still doing a really bad job at the basics. You know, we don't have to get all sexy about zero days, you know, and, and pay attention to the shiny thing. Um, but it's important for us to do the basics, do it well. And I think, you know, tools like ours, you know, can really help people identify who's not doing the basics well. Although we can label being on the latest version of a particular software as basics, it, we all know that sometimes is not very basic. It's very counterintuitive <laughs> with all the people that were on log for shell one dot X and right? like, or all the people that hadn't downloaded the latest solar winds. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the fact they're still downloading it, like that's very telling of the problem of how much work it is to actually upgrade your software to be in the latest application server or whatever, you know, library or whatever it is. We somehow constructed software very poorly that, that we painted ourselves in a corner like that. Yeah, or these people that are like, um, I don't know, they have like a date, you know, NPM module, um, and the, the things downloaded like 10 million times a week, you know, 
you know, that's supply chain risk, right? Yes. If someone decides yes. to mess with that. And this happened actually prior to mm-hmm. SolarWinds. The big poster child for supply chain risk was uh, EventStream, an NPM package that mm-hmm. someone figured out was used in a lot of crypto wallets. And so they actually, this is a sub-zero day, I call it, um, because they actually joined the event stream, picked up a shovel and started doing work, and they actually injected a backdoor into event stream. Once it had finally showed up, that's when they started siphoning off millions of dollars of crypto. Yeah, I think it's those attacks that are going to they're going to haunt us for some time. So, yeah. or the people yeah. that are wiping, you know, um, Ukrainian and Russian, you know, stuff um, because it's a protest wear. Um, you know, or one of the best defenses I heard people say that you could do for Russian malware is just install the Russian keyboard and locale on your servers, and then it, it'll just stay asleep. Mm. Um, it won't deploy phase two behaviors because it's, oh, this is a comrade's machine. Let's not do anything bad here. Yeah, certainly. Well, questions for Mike, Josh, Tyler, Larry? I'm good. I'm kind of impressed. Well, thank you. I'll take that as the compliment that I believe it was intended to be. So. I love it yeah, was. And I, I love the the philosophy tie in, Mike. I thought that was really that was really good, and I enjoyed your analogies, and I hope our audience did too because I thought they were really good. And well, Mike, thanks. yeah, I um, like I said, uh, look for those twelve lectures. You know that I have. Um, there's a lot of my sort of. Uh, Thirty years of, of experience and wisdom that you know I've been teaching to the NYU students, and I wanted to give it away because I didn't think that class I'd be teaching it again. Mm. I was teaching a new class. Um, I was asked to guest lecture on uh, uh, a hybrid class with uh, NYU IT uh, department in Tandon and, and their law, um, because I you know intellectual property and law and, and infosec is a, an interesting new space. You might call it like privacy engineering and things like that. Uh, but anyway, they they had me guest lecture and I came in and and they had to reschedule it though because. Um, I needed to swap with one of the other guest uh, lecturers, uh, which was um, Keith, uh, General Keith Alexander. And so I thought, well, I'm starting to keep really good company now on my talks. And uh, I have a unique perspective, I think, to bring, given that philosophy piece. So I'm, I, I love that you appreciate it. So thank yeah, you. We're, we're working on getting General Alex- Alexander on the show. Mike, we just have five questions left for you. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Do it. Bring it. <clears throat> Three words to describe yourself. Oh, jazz, traveling, philosopher. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, I don't know. I suppose uh, nitrous oxide, laughing gas. Huh. If you were to book about yourself, what would the title be? Oh, Tools for Thought. This is a book I actually do want to write. There you um, go. That's awesome. Uh, help people with critical thinking. In the age of information, ignorance is a choice. And a bit, at least 54% of this country um, chooses to be ignorant right now. So I'd like to try to fix that. What is your favorite hacker movie? Uh, I'm going to go with Mr. Robot, even though it's a TV series. Sure. It's Except, the only one that actually that. has real technology in it. Like, you know, sure. um, Femto Cells, Rubber Duckies, Kali Linux. Nice. Choose two celebrities to be your parents, alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise two celebrities well i can't imagine any cooler dad than george clooney right i mean he's got the voice he's got the the bravado you know the oceans films um and then uh a fictitious uh mother figure Hmm. actually i'm gonna go with laurie anderson i don't know if you know her she's a performance artist um she was married to lou reed and you know she's just a goddess she's amazing um she said something when he was admitted to the uh hall of fame when he passed away and she said every person dies three times once when their heart stops beating once when they're you know cremated or buried in the ground and once when someone says their name for the last time last time and so i just think she's just so amazing and and brilliant and and i love her stuff so um i'll go with the celebrity laurie anderson and george clooney couple mike thank you so much for appearing on paul security weekly well, this has been fun, and uh, I'm happy to uh, have spent the time with you tonight. Uh, and thanks all. And anyone wants to uh, ask me questions, um, shoot me an email. I'm very accessible. And uh, you know, enjoy, be safe, and uh, stay curious. Thank For you. folks that want to learn more, you can visit securityweekly.com forward slash security scorecard. Coming up next, the lovely Amanda Berlin. Stay tuned. 